I'm Dave Lee, also known as uh, Jerry Negro, uh, Jakarta, Raven Mays, Sunburst Band, Akabu. I've recorded under a number of pseudonyms over the years I've been doing it, which is since 1988 when I released my first record as MDM, Get Busy. And I was born on the Isle of Wight in 1964. Uh, in somewhere called Newport and uh, my parents moved away from there when I was very young, was about six, seven months old. My dad got a job in the University of Essex so we moved to Essex and we moved around quite a lot in Essex uh, until we eventually we settled in somewhere called uh, Thorpe Socombe which is a little village in between Clacton-on-Sea and Colchester and that's where I, I grew up and uh, from about five onwards anyway and it's kind of like a little Essex village I don't know what the population is a couple of thousand so um, my main dose of music was Top of the Pops that's why I used to sit every Thursday 7.30 sit through Tomorrow's World to watch Top of the Pops and it's funny they've been rerunning all the Top of the Pops from like 1975 1976 on BBC Four recently so it's funny to see them all again and not just Top of the Pops actually see the reality of it which is uh, quite a lot of it isn't very good but that was the only way you could hear music then there wasn't an MTV yeah, okay you could listen to the radio I guess but I mean for, on television Top of the Pops was the only program and I was really into like glam rock that was the first music I remember Sweet Slade uh, Gary Glitter I suppose not someone you admit to liking nowadays but I, I did when I was when I was eight and um, I can remember one time after a particularly inspired performance by someone like Sweet or Gary Glitter. I went out down to the shed and tried to make a guitar out of a bit of wood and some uh, elastic bands or something like that, which obviously wasn't really a very successful project. But I think I remember we got a record player when I, right around the early 70s. And uh, my mum bought uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and um, her Godspell. She's not that she's religious, but um, they were playing a lot in the house. And my dad's a big jazz fan. And um, during the 70s, I suppose my taste changed a little bit. And I can remember one time I was watching Swap Shop with Niall Edmonds and Heatwave Boogie Nights came on. And that really opened my mind to sort of, I suppose, disco music. Because up until then, I think watching Top of the Pops, a lot of the... Um, the more exciting music had been the glam rock stuff and the black acts tended to be things like the Drifters or Barry White or whatever. So all around the, the mid-70s it was changing. There was, you know, obviously stuff like uh, the Jacksons and Heatwave and even things like Boney M, Donna Summer, just chart disco, which I really started buying sort of like five singles a year, but it tended to start becoming more swapping over from Sweet to... Um, Pop, you know, even things like I lost my heart to a Starship Trooper and whatever. I like poppy disco. I think uh, there were some great records made in that period. And around the same time, my brother, who's a couple of years younger than me, we both um, had got guitars and uh, I think we got some bongos as well. And we'd started just making very primitive recordings. Um, just using drums and overdubbing using his Waltham cassette recorder and then playing that back and recording uh, the recording of ourselves with more overdubs and singing we both used to sing and uh, I, I mean it was just it was just fun but um, some of the stuff you learn when you do that is actually the same principle as when you're making a piece of music now and um, yeah, it's all just a learning process and also having the courage to just um, you utilize your ideas or whatever comes into your head and uh, I guess around the late 70s I started I, I'd only really known about music that was in the charts and I remember it was a real eye-opener one Sunday night I was ill in bed and um, I was just li li trying to listen, listen, find something to listen to in the radio and I found Radio Luxembourg and in that era it was a very disco, I think it was the top 20 disco chart on a Sunday night. They had a disco computer chart and a disco album chart on a Monday night and I started listening to that because I thought God there's all this music that isn't in the charts, it's really good. You know, That's where I first heard things like Azimuth Jazz Carnival and Patrice Russian and Dancing in Outer Space and lots of these records which are still considered classics now which weren't getting played on Radio 1 or outside probably clubs and very, you know, 
know, maybe Robbie Vincent would be someone else I'd later heard play them on Radio London. So that was a really big eye opener for me. I thought it isn't just the music that's in the charts, there's actually lots of other music. I guess a lot of people, kids, you know, just assume that everything everything that's good is the stuff that's in the charts so obviously that isn't isn't the case so um i think up until around that time i was still had other interests like skateboarding and other sort of scale electrics cars other sort of kids things i think my my whole focus went into music spending all my money on albums and i started buying like a lot of used secondhand records i started find, you know i buy a new album by bt express and then I'd go around to all the second-hand shops locally, which, which at that point there was loads. In Colchester there was like three or four second-hand record shops and in nearby towns like Ipswich and Norwich, I, I could go up to um, there for the day with sort of like 20 pound and come back with sort of like 60 albums, you know, because there was like lots of play, or like you know, five for a pound and whatever, and you know, getting some great music really cheap. And uh, it was a fun, fun time, I guess, you know, you'd hear something on the radio by Roy Ayers or something who I'd never heard of in 1979, 1980, and you'd find out, oh, this guy's actually been going for, since the mid 60s, you know, and uh, you'd think, oh, I'm sure I've seen an album by him in, uh, Andy's records in Ipswich and then you go back there two years later and it would still be there you know you seem to be the only person who was an interest in this music you know in the sort of like 50 mile radius I can remember having a conversation with a friend I think it was about 1983 in my bedroom and we were just listening to the first Jelly Bean album I think it was called What's Up Ski and it had his version it was Dug a Donut on it and I think some sidewalk talk but anyway it was his first it was like a mini lp and we were saying well wow, wow, what a great living that guy's you know he's remixes for a living that's his job what a great job that would be you know and um i thought well that's what i would like to do but being sort of at the time i was just someone who was i was unemployed in living in sort of like on the outskirts of collected on sea it just didn't seem like a possibility that career path was open to me but um i had a lucky couple of events there's a guy I was I'd met through James Hamilton's column who was advertising he could find rare records and I'd spoken to him on the phone about a couple of records I wanted and we kind of stayed in contact and he got a job in a record shop in London called Smithers and Lee that was like a new mega store at the Marble Arch end of Oxford Street and he got went for the interview, got the job, and then I think he decided not to take the job because it was a pay cut to him and I think he's the, he was working in the city and he, and he said, look, I've recommended you for the job. And I thought, great. I mean, and I went, I went for the interview, but I sort of elaborated a bit about my past and I got the job. And that sort of got me into, I suppose, what the music business work. I was in London, I went for, and uh, I made the best of that, for, but the shop was, was doomed, unfortunately. It just wasn't taking enough money. And I managed to get a job in rough trade distribution. After I'd been there nine months, I went for this other interview a rough trade distribution had just started distributing dance music because up until then they'd been very much an indie rock distributor doing lots of labels like 4AD and Mute. It was more sort of like what you would call indie music and electronic music and Mute had just started up this satellite label called Rhythm King and they needed somebody at Rough Trade who understood dance music and um, I was what they got because uh, I mean the wages were pretty, they were a drop from the record shop but I just thought I've got to get out of this record shop before it goes tits up and I guess I was paranoid back then because I just got this break that I was somehow going to, it was all going to go wrong. I was going to end up back in, you know, collecting on sea and thinking, you know, oh, I've made a, made a mess of it. So I was really determined to sort of make the best of the situation. I had, I got this break that I thought, well, maybe I can make a career out of this. So, um, Yes, yeah, so I got, this, got the job in Rough Trade and it was hard work in Rough Trade to start with because nobody there really knew what my job was, including me. I, they hadn't really distributed dance music before. My first task was to go and open accounts with a lot of the dance shops like Groove Records and uh, Record Shack in Berwick Street and then the equivalent of those shops like Piccadilly in Manchester. And in those days, there was quite a big network of dance shops throughout the UK. You know, most cities, Nottingham, Glasgow, there was a few shops which were more your sort of DJ dance retailer who would sell imports and more specialist. But that's where the DJs in town would go and buy their records. And those places didn't always have accounts with Rough Trade. But the only problem I did have at that point, Rhythm King didn't really have anything they wanted. They were still learning as well. So it would have been much easier to open up those accounts if you had records these shops definitely wanted to have in stock. But eventually Rhythm King 
as a label, got their act together and started releasing some records like uh, The Cookie Crew, Rock the House, and Bomb the Bass, Beat This, and actually some really popular records. So it did actually come to fruition slowly. And around that time, there was a sort of, uh, an out of character record came out of 4AD by Mars called Pump Up the Volume. So all of a sudden it went from me having hardly anything to do, but, n but not enough, to all of a sudden it's like bloody hell, it's like a snowball. And it was, I did, couldn't cope with it. It was, uh, it was, it was, it, it exploded, which was great. Uh, but um, it was, it was, it was a lot to, a lot to deal with at the time. Because um, I was pretty inexperienced, really. That was the thing. I was just learning as I went along. I suppose I was just thrown in the deep end, and um, at points you sink and at points you swim. You know, it's not, it's, it's not like you cope with every uh, everything that's thrown at you. Um, throughout this time, at the same time as doing that, since I first heard early house music, I'd always thought, well, I might not be able to sound like Earth Wind and Fire. Or a brass construction, which is the music I'm actually buying, but I think I could sound like Ray's Jack the Groove, Jack the Groove, Jack, Jack, Jack. Jack the Groove, if I had a drum machine and a couple of early synths. Jack, Jack, Jack. Around the time I was working at Rough Trade, I met another guy from school uh, and I played him some early house because he'd managed to convince some local businessmen to set up a, a studio for him, which is around the back of this guy's garage. This guy had a, a sort of commercial garage and it was in this house around the back. So we started making some music together and he didn't know what he was doing because he was more of a rocker. I mean, we just didn't know about, you know, okay, these tracks have got a drum machine. We, there wasn't the internet to go online, so they're, they're all using a 909. You didn't know where they got the drum sounds from. You didn't know where the bass set. We were stabbing around in the dark, you know, and there wasn't sample CDs and whatever like that. So it took us a while to make anything any good, but, um, or anything even, not, I was even prepared to play to anybody. It was just, we were, we were experimenting and trying to, you know, I guess I can see now why, why we weren't getting it right. But um, at the time it was very frustrating and his monitoring in his studio was terrible. He had this really ancient um, 16 track machine, which uh, took a lot of top end off the sounds and we couldn't work out why does our stuff sound so dull? But it was just because he, he had these really old tapes he was reusing and whatever. So it was just, it was just one of those things, you, it seems obvious now, but at the time you just, you didn't know, you know, you didn't, couldn't tell. I, I guess it was just trial and error. But um, we finished this track by MDM called Get Busy. Get, 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 get busy. I think it was around June 1988, we finished it. And around that time, I got to the point with Rough Trade, I've been working there for about 18 months, become quite involved sort of a and r -ing and helping labels who were, you know, saying, well, why don't you get this, why don't you get Cold Cut to do a remix? And they say, who are they? And I'd say, well, these are Jonathan Moore and whatever. And they, they'd end up signing them. And I think, well, I'm giving away a lot of these ideas to labels, which is fine. I don't mind. I'm still, you know, I'm working, working for them. But wouldn't I be better doing it not for myself, but maybe a little bit more involved as A&R as rather than just giving other people uh, ideas. So um, I spoke to Rough Trade and I said, why don't you, rather than me do it being your guy at distribution, why don't you give me my own label? And uh, I suppose at the point they were, they were doing so well out of dance music, he said, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I started up my own label called Republic Records, which lasted for about three years. and. Um, that was that was a that was a fun time. I suppose you don't really realise something is a golden era until the era's over. And uh, 1988, I guess it was all happening, and um, that coincided. The first release on Republic was my first record, which is MDM Get Busy, which I mentioned before, which is not a great record. It's like a old school pump up the volume copy, but I guess it was it was a starting point. And I, I, by the time it came out, I was embarrassed by it. I thought this is not. I don't like this, but. It came out and it sold okay. By today's standards, it sold bloody loads. But by those standards, it was okay. And I thought, well, actually, it's not obviously not as bad as I think it is. It's come out. I, I've, I've heard it. People play it in clubs and on the radio. It encourages you to make more. And that's what I always say to people who are a producer and I'm, uh, you know, I'm starting off and I'm, you know, making stuff. I said, well, the, one of the best things you can do is once you've got something and you think, look, it's pretty much finished. Even if you're fed up with it, get it out because. 
if, if releasing it and getting a few people say slapping you on the back and saying, oh, I really like it, or I played that last night, I've really, that really is worth so much more than just having it lying around in, on your hard drive or on a DAT tape somewhere. I've just released an album, which I convinced myself half of it was rubbish before, not rubbish, but substandard. You can get so fed up with things. When you've heard something 2,000 times, you're not objective anymore. <laughs> That was a good thing for me, The Republic. As well as I learned from A&Ring, like other people, and I'd been on the front line selling records to shops when I was in the distribution doing telesales, so I kind of felt in touch with what people wanted. I just kind of knew, like I know when I was phoning up a certain shop, they take 30 copies of that sort of record, but they'd only take five copies of something else. So I kind of thought, I, know, I kind of knew what was selling, I suppose. And I knew how it worked on manufacturing records. I think this is a good sort of apprenticeship for anyone who's, you know, gonna, you know, put out their own. I've never been frightened of pressing up records or putting out my own records or, cause I just think I've, I did it a few times. I know it's not actually that complicated. Um, whereas I've noticed other people always, oh, I'll give it to another label to do that. And I think, well, why do that? It's just giving away some of the profit and there's not that much of it. I think house music was generally made up until maybe 87, 88, was all from New York and obviously from Chicago. I think once it started becoming popular in Europe, it took a while, but people started making it over here. So there's people like Eddie Richards who made that Acid Man track, and then obviously Simon Harris who did the, um, the bass Hello you can, can You Go. I think it was kind of hip hop was very popular here and house was very popular. And I think a lot of our early UK productions were kind of a cross between hip hop and house, like things like Pump Up the Volume and um, Bomb the Bass Beat This. And there were house records, but they had scratching in them. It was kind of an amalgamation of sort of like uh, Salt and Pepper and uh, Chicago House. We wanted that sort of because I think scratching was still very cool then, and uh, sampling break beats. I guess what was great about that era is nothing had been sampled. So everything was there for the taking. Love Sensation a cappella, which has been probably sampled like 500 times now, then had never been sampled. And there's all these, I think the first a cappella anonymous album, which was a compilation of a cappellas, which is just the vocals only, which have been on various 12 inches throughout the 80s. And I should imagine pretty much every line from every other, all of those a cappellas has been somebody's hook at some point in the subsequent 20 years. It's, so it was a fun time, and I suppose there was no rules about sampling. So no one knew, like, oh, if I sample this, I'm gonna to have to clear it. There wasn't any clearance rules. Those were made up over the following years. So people were sampling a big bit of Michael Jackson, and for a while they were getting away with it because there was nobody really knew what, what was the protocol here. We don't know, you know? So the major labels, you know, after a couple of years, you know, they said, well, actually, you can't sample Lou Reed without paying us for it. But the, it, it was a sampling sport, I suppose, for those, for those early years. And um, it was, the, the, I think there was uh, people like Rhythm King uh, were one of the first labels to actually say, well, actually, why don't we get, we've got Tim Cinema who comes in every week and Mark Moore who comes in every week and plays with the new imports. Why don't we put them in the studio with, a, with an engineer and see what they come up with themselves? And that was, I think, the start of the DJ making records as opposed to just being the DJ and mixing together other people's records. So I think that's what stemmed from Chicago House, which I suppose was mainly made by DJs, is British DJs and European DJs started making their own records and I suppose they were tailoring them more to a European audience so um, whereas we I suppose those early days of Chicago House we lapped it up those records weren't made for us but we we loved them but then once we started making them we were sort of you know and, and that's seeing things like the Belgian new beat and some of those early um, sort of productions from mainland Europe, they were, uh, they were tougher, they were more electronic, they were more white, because that's what the, the people who were making them were, you know, we were, we were, we were making what, what we are, I suppose. In the early 80s, around the Essex area, there was actually quite a lot of good clubs happening. Uh, there, was, there used to be a thing on a Sunday night called the Embassy Suite, there used to be DJs there, a guy called Gary Soul. Bob Jones used to DJ there, and that was more like a soul, jazz, um, 
funk, but it was good music, quite a good crowd. I mean, that wasn't a commercial night at all. That was a music heads night. And I used to go there sometimes, but I can't say I used to go that often because it was a Sunday night, you needed to drive up there and whatever. And this was kind of before I had a car and whatever. So it was only something I could only go to if I, if I could convince someone else to go drive, which is often, often the way back then. And um, my Bible in those days was James Hamilton's column. That used to come out every Thursday, and I'd buy that. And I'd also listen to the radio a lot. I was a radio, more, more a radio than clubs, I suppose. I mean, not that I've, I've always enjoyed going to clubs. You know, there's another place near me called the Tartan House, which I used to go to, which used to be in the middle of nowhere, called Infrating, a place called that. And that used to have good nights as well. Though some of those nights always had a reputation for being um, a little bit moody, which you've always used to have a sometimes I'd have a problem with convincing people to go because oh, well, didn't someone get their teeth knocked out there last week or something so yeah so I used to listen to the radio a lot people like Robbie Vincent and uh, anything I could tape because once I had, I had this FM music centre I could actually tape off the radio so I used to like listening to uh, Tony Monson on Essex radio and then James Hamilton's column I used to read about the things and you'd maybe hear them on the radio that weekend and I think maybe that's why I've always with my productions always wanted things that sound good on the radio as well as sounding good in a club because I think it's a different there's some records which are great club records but aren't great radio records and um, I think the best records I think are good on both you know but um, it wasn't until probably I came up to London that I started probably going out more and meeting more people who are like-minded musically I used to go to like High and Hope in Dingwalls where it used to be Norman Jay and Frankie Fonset and um, quite a lot of one-off events, you know, and they'd be all over, like in the Rur Groove era, you go somewhere, you know, uh, there used to be a club, The Brain, I used to go to sometimes as well, which was in Soho, but other places in Kensington, I can't even remember what they were, what they were called, but they were just one-off, like, places you go and it would just be 70s funk and Rur Groove, Norman Jay sometimes as well at the Bass Clef in, which is uh, in Hoxton Square, and Hoxton was like the middle of nowhere then, it was all just warehouses and whatever, so, um, I wasn't as much someone who was like a real out and out clubber though. I wasn't someone who, who was going out like, you know, like all weekend going out on a Friday night, not coming home to a Sunday, uh, you know, afternoon or whatever. But I mean, I went to the Hacienda quite a few times in that late 80s era because, I mean, we had brought over Blaze and other acts, so we would travel around, you know, so that was a good way of seeing what was going on you know, in different places and, you know, because you can get quite, if you live in London and go out to London clubs, you can get quite London-centric with your attitude. So it's interesting going outside London and seeing that sort of like what you thought was a massive record actually isn't really that popular out in reality, you know. So uh, I've always tried to, uh, you know, remember that sort of like, you know, like in the same way as HMV Oxford Street isn't typical of HMVs in the rest of the country, you know. So it's, uh, we, we're spoiled in lots of ways here. I guess during the 80s, I DJed probably, uh, probably about 20 times between 1980 and 1990. I was someone who had a large record collection. I loved music and I was buying records and I wanted to be a DJ. But I mean, being a DJ back then, it wasn't easy to get into the, you know, get, just go to a club and say, oh, do you want me to DJ for you? I tried that. I remember trying to put on my own night at this local club and it didn't really work. And um, I DJed at a few parties. I've DJed at, you know, friends events and whatever, but it, it wasn't really going anywhere. And, um, when I moved to London, then I managed to DJ a little bit more, you know, playing Rare Groove and, you know, some early house, played on pirate radio a few times. But I mean, I wasn't really um, becoming a household name. It wasn't until I started making music that I started getting offered gigs, you know, and then, then all of a sudden I was getting offered like pretty high profile gigs because I had records out that were successful. So, and I think that's increasingly become the way that DJs establish themselves nowadays. I think it's quite hard to just become a well-known DJ just on the back of being a DJ. I think you need that advert of a record. Uh, and it, so it was in the early 90s that I started DJing more seriously, or actually getting paid for it, I suppose, uh, because I, I'd had records out and people had heard me. So I think, you know, that's when a promoter feels confident putting your name on a flyer, and you think, well, like, yeah, people have heard of this guy. Whereas I, you can be an absolutely incredible DJ, but if people haven't heard of you, 
why are they going to come and see you? That, that would be the logic that uh, a um, promoter, I suppose, would use. What I always like DJ-wise, if I'm going out, is people who are eclectic, I suppose. I'm not interested generally in going out and hearing four hours of the same sort of music. So I, I guess, and a lot of the DJs who are a bit more eclectic tend to be a bit older. I mean, I like, I like Giles Peterson as a DJ. I like Tony Humphreys as a DJ, because I know that I'll hear music I, don't, I haven't heard before. So I'm not good, I don't want to hear lots of stuff I already know. I like to hear new music. And I also like to hear someone playing maybe some very gospely garage track and then something slightly more techno -y afterwards. I don't want to hear just stuff that is very samey sounding. So I, that's generally what I, I like to hear when I, when I, when I go out. And um, I, I suppose I'm not necessarily going to be on the dance floor for all of the night, but I will be listening to the music, you know. So um, maybe I'm not, I, I know that if I'm DJing, I'm often looking at the dance floor, saying, are people enjoying this? And that's, it's a difficult one because you know, it, you don't have to necessarily be uh, in the middle of the dance floor with your arms in the air to be appreciating what's going on. So it, it, that's when you're DJing, the barometer of sort of like, you know, you can't always be making people go crazy. So, I, and I think that's, I'm conscious when I'm DJing, it's like, I am know that sometimes I'm gonna bore people a little bit, but as long as I know I'm gonna take it up again, to me, that's the, if you've got it up in fifth gear all night, it stops actually being in fifth gear. You actually go back down because it's just it's relentless, but lacking in uh, dynamic. So I like someone who's prepared to take it right down. And I think you've got to. It's, it's having a little bit of um, courage and taking risks. And the guy I heard uh, last summer, and I, I enjoyed his set, even though I didn't like every record he played, was Theo Parrish, because he was really playing some stuff which is to no, by no stretch of the imagination was dance floor music. And it's not music I would ever play, but I thought, fair enough, mate, it's, it definitely got dynamics and it would be some abstract electronic record, then it'd be James Brown. And I thought, well, it's interesting. For me, it's interesting there was some girls coming to the DJ booth complaining, oh, this is rubbish and whatever, which you're always going to get if you're going to take those sort of risks. But I thought, for me, as a sort of other DJ and as a, um, a muso of house music or whatever you want to call it, I enjoyed it, you know, and I would more rather hear that in a way than just hear, you know, three hours of house music seamlessly mixed together, because I just thought it was, it was a bit different. When we first started making uh, music, I always thought, I guess I bought so many disco records and producer-led projects which had names that weren't really anything to do with the actual person who made the record, you know, so uh, I, I thought it was a bit fun thinking of names. I always enjoyed the creativity of sort of thinking of like a, a name for an act. Though often when it actually came, if I'm put under pressure to think, if you said you've got to think of a name sort of like for an act this afternoon, sometimes it's not so easy. It's more you come up with it when you're uh, on a train or something it, when it's not required, like all these things. But, um, so the first record, the MDM thing, that was just our initials. It was myself, another guy called Mike, and an, a guy called Mark Ryder. So the three of us together, and he was like the scratch DJ Mark. As I got further into it, um, I just thought, I always thought Dave Lee was a boring name, to be honest with you. And I thought, would I buy a record by Dave Lee? I mean, I would have to have heard it first. I definitely wouldn't invent, it wouldn't be one of those when I'm in a junk shop and I'm looking through records, I wouldn't think, well, that looks interesting, Dave Lee. So I, I, I've always thought, well, let me think of some name which maybe has got half a chance of people saying, oh, what, what's that one like? You know, if it's on the wall of a record shop. And I, I had a record out by Raven Mays in 1989. And I, I like that name, Raven Mays. And I was planning to use that again. I'd done that as a scam, so I'd, I'd licensed it to this bona fide label called Quark, who were a, a quite a popular garage label. They'd had people like um, Blaze and um, other US producers. It was quite a cool label. And I'd done this track which sampled an old um, sort of New York classic that was generally a fairly unknown record to most people at that point by Exodus called Together Forever. And I thought, why don't I license this to this Quark label? And we think up a funny name, which was Raven Maze, and uh, let it come over as an import and let people think it's American. So um, 
We did that and I, uh, it actually started doing quite well. So we had to come up with a, a press photo. So I got, I had an old album by The Reflections and we cut out a picture of one of the guys who had mirror sunglasses on and an afro. And um, we used that as a press photo. I think the guy from our, uh, who did our artwork put a New York skyline behind it. And it got printed in Record Mirror in lots of other places. And I thought, oh, this is great. This is actually quite a lot of fun. Because I thought people are gonna, because a few people knew it was me. And I thought, you know, some people are gonna, someone's gonna blab and whatever, but no one did. And we made up this ridiculous um, story in the, PR, the press sheet about him being a, an ex-con. He was in prison, so he used to play in a steel band in Disneyland and whatever. And it was, so that, that I thought, well, this is, this is a more fun way of doing it than if I do. And I thought it, it worked on the inverted snobbery and it was an interesting story and people printed it. So I, I, I did another record about a year later, which um, I thought I'd do the same thing again, but with a different label and a different name. I thought well, I thought it was fine, I did it once. People won't expect me to do it a second time. So, uh, and this I licensed to a, la a label called New Groove. Again, with a cool label, I had early Kenny Dope and Burrell Brothers and whatever. I thought, that, that, that's, that's the cool label at the moment. Let me see if they want this track I've done on my own. And, um, I sent it to them and said, yes, we do, we'd love to do it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if we're gonna get it out, we need we need to give you get all the label copy by like tomorrow afternoon or something. And I thought, okay, but I haven't got a name for this one. Uh, and I couldn't think of a name, I was under pressure, I couldn't think of it. And I had a pile of records next to my desk at work and one of them was by Pal Joey and one of them was by J. Walter Negro and the Loose Joints. And I thought, why don't I just put those two names together? And I, I thought that I wasn't really happy with it. I was still trying to think of another now, I thought, but I just had to. It was either that or it didn't come out for three months. So I did it. And I never ever thought of that as something like I'd ever going to be being addressed as Joey 20 years later, which happens all the time. But uh, I just thought it was a name for that record. And um, I suppose, and then, and then a year later, a year or so later, I had another record out. And I was going to use the name Raven Mays because I prefer that name. And um, I played it to a friend of mine. He said, oh, this doesn't sound like Raven Maze. Raven Maze is more Latin-y. This sounds like the one you had out in New Groove. You should use that name. And I used that name again. And that record ended up going on to become actually some sort of hit, got in the bottom of the top 40. And that became the established name that I was known as. And then since then, why have I used different pseudonyms? I guess because I've, at points, had a lot of records out. There's been some years or some, maybe over a three month period where I've released like, like maybe five or six records. And I thought, well, Sometimes you're signed to a label under a name. So if I'm signed to Ministry of Sound as Jakarta, I can't do anything else as Jakarta apart from what I do for Ministry of Sound. Um, so I will think of a name that I'm signed to, to Ministry under and that's the name that I will use for that project, but it doesn't stop me doing anything else myself. And I guess I think if I've got five records out, is it less confusing that they're under different names or they're all under the same name? Or would people say, oh, I heard that record, oh, which one is it? Is it that one, that one, or that one? I suppose in my head, some of them have got a different sound, like Akabu is a more of the deep house thing, Sunburst Band is more sort of live, jazz funk, um, Jakarta was more sort of film soundtrack. So there, there is a difference. So I think in some ways, I would agree, it's diluted. Um, so I still meet people say, oh, I didn't know you were Jakarta. Or people say, I didn't know that was you. So I think, well, it would have been better if this was all, if I was Todd Terry or something and everything's out under the one name, it may well have been a better, I was di sort of diluting what I do. But in other ways, I thought, well, is it more confusing if everything was under the same name? There's quite a variety of styles and sometimes quite a lot of things out at the same time. I don't think there was really a right way of doing it. You know, both ways have their pitfalls. I think more than any other industry I can think of, the music industry's changed so much in the last 20 years. I mean, there's been two things that have changed, big things. One is the internet. The internet, the way you consume music, buy music, and also the digital file. I suppose up until about 2003, 2004, if you wanted a piece of music, you had to buy it. You had to buy the CD or you had to buy the record. I suppose now you don't have to buy it. It's quite easy to either go extract it from your friend's CD or get it online for nothing, unfortunately. That's changed everything so much. I mean, back in like when I was first 
releasing records throughout the 90s and whatever, you know, if there was a record that you made, say you made a hit or a potential hit, you might release maybe a thousand white labels, you might even sell 5,000 on, on your own label, but then they would delete it and then they could build up demand over the course of three or four months enough to push that record into the charts when they did re-release it, you know, and uh, that happened loads of times. Voodoo Ray, Expansions, Move Your Body. There's so many examples of records that were big club hits, so probably sold quite a lot, and then supplies cut off, leave it for three months, then it goes into the top 40, and then it gets to a whole new audience, and that record becomes a proper crossover hit. You can't do that anymore. You've got to keep it on sale all the time because otherwise people are going to get it for nothing. So it's very difficult for an underground record to get into the top 40 now because there's no way you can, but you can't ever build up a big demand for something because as soon as we get something in and we promo it, we pretty much have to release it at the same time. We can't sort of think, okay, we're gonna get all the DJs in the country playing this, everyone going out and hearing it weekends, going to the record shop and asking for it because they can just, unfortunately, either go and look online and they can probably get it for nothing. So you have to give them the opportunity to buy it rather than get it for nothing, but that means it's it's very hard to for anything to ever, that's just a big club record to build up that momentum to get it into the top 40. So that's a big change. There's lots of positives. I mean, I think I'm not someone who's, oh, it was better back then, it's worse now. I think there's, with any change, there's some good and some bad. I mean, I've got my own website. I can sell direct to the public and on some releases we sell a lot of them you know I'm surprised we can sell a few hundred of something which I'm keeping all the money from those releases um, you don't need to go into a 500 pound a day studio to make a record lots of people are making records on their laptops I don't know if that's always a good thing because it just means we've got lots more product out there and always not always lots of product doesn't necessarily mean lots of good product I think there's lots of average product and I think sometimes that can just flood the market and make it just harder to find the good stuff I still think there's just as much good stuff if not more you know good music being made but it just means that on Beatport every week there's like 5,000 releases or something and it's impossible to listen to all of them you don't you know to, to commit to pressing it up to vinyl meant that it had to be some sort of um, not necessarily quality control, because lots of rubbish records made it to vinyl, but there had to be some sort of investment in it. So to get some sort of, to get that investment, there had to be some sort of, I suppose, people thought they could get their money back. Whereas uh, now I think, you know, if someone's knocked something up together, they've got nothing to lose by releasing it. You know, whereas then they did have something to lose. Um, as for David Guetta and the sort of whole sort of, you know, R&B star makes house music, uh, I mean, good luck to him. Do you know what I mean? That's all I, I, do I like it? Not, not really, I don't particularly. I was not something I would ever listen to at home myself. I didn't mind the one he did with Kid Cudi, Memories, I quite like that one. But in general, it's pop music and it's to me, it's like the modern equivalent of something like Culture Beat, Mr. Vane or Snap, Rhythm as a Dancer. It's the, it's the Euro dance from the late 80s and early 90s. It, it, it's that, it's just the European high energy synth based dance music and um, I don't think it's anything particularly new but he's good at making it and he's had a lot of hits so lots of people are going to want to work with him. It just, I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, I think that nowadays success counts more than anything else. So I think he's been very, very successful and, uh, uh, and that means that, uh, you know, a lot of people also want to be successful, want to work with him and um, good luck to him if he's getting sort of like £150,000 for a gig, then, you know, he's only getting that because he's had the success, you know, so you can't really knock somebody. I, we'd all be annoyed if someone started getting that and he hadn't had the success, but it's not the case. So uh, I don't really, I'm not someone who hates other people because they've done well. Whether, whether I like what they've done or not, it doesn't matter, they, they've done it, you know, and other people do, you know, and I've met him, he, I DJ with him once, he seemed like a lovely guy, so I can't say, oh, he's a, he's a prick. He wasn't, he was, he was very, very, very nice, so, uh, you know. Nowadays, I run Z Records, and that's how I release most of my music. I mean, the first thing on Z Records was 1990, so we've been going 22 years. But we've had quite a lot of dormant periods. In the 90s, I guess I was doing lots of remixes, so I might, not, I might have released one record in 1995, 
or two records in 1996. Nowadays, we're probably releasing, with digital releases, probably about 20, 25 records a year. I say records, releases, whatever you want to call them now. I would always call them records. What I love about doing it this way is when I finish something, I can hang on to it for three months, I can hang on to it for a year, or I can release it straight away, I can play it out, I can tinker with it. I don't have anyone telling me, oh, I don't think you should have that riff in there, or the vocal's too quiet, the vocal's... It's just up to me. So I'm a, I suppose maybe I'm a control freak, and, and it's not that I don't want other people's input, but ultimately the bottom line stops with me. If I, don't, I can disregard it if I want to, you know, so I might play it to someone and they might tell me, oh, that's an interesting, maybe I'll, I'll take that on board. But if I think, no, I don't want to, I don't have to. And I can package it how I want to, I can get whoever I want to remix it, within reason, obviously, financially. So I've done tracks uh, and I thought, well, I wouldn't mind shopping this to another label. And I hate the shopping stuff. I hate sending stuff around to people. And, you know, you don't know whether to really big it up and come across as maybe a bit of an idiot by saying, oh, it's great, it's great. Or if you play it down, then they think, oh, what's wrong with it? Why doesn't he want to release it himself? So it's a great way of, uh, for me, of, of releasing your own music. And also I hold on to the copyrights of everything forever. So I'm not signing stuff away. And, you know, much as, you know, they might not want to be like that, a lot of labels aren't great at accounting to you. I know what, what money is made on these records at least I know I'll get it, you know, so we're dealing direct with iTunes and with TrackSource, Beatport, all the download sites. So I think we're maximising, as a producer-led label, we're maximising the income that is there, you know, so um, I I'm happy with that. And I I what I try to do is, you know, we release quite a lot of singles. I pay people to do remixes of the singles. So if I like what someone's doing, more than like, like signing a record by them, I'd probably get them to do a remix because it just make, makes it easier for the accounting and whatever, you know, it's a one-off payment and rather than signing something off them and then having to pay publishing to the MCPS. Because it just it's difficult to make money out of releasing music. I think it's much easier really making money out of releasing your own music than releasing other people's music because you're only getting a smaller bit of the pie. <laughs> So I've just finished an album by Sunburst Band, which is coming out early August. And that's kind of me doing my sort of jazz funk disco. It's a live band, we do gigs. And what I kind of miss from music from now, which I like from music, not that there's, I don't want to sound like one of these people like it's better, 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 better back then, because I don't think that. But I do think there's certain things which are better back then and there's certain things that are better now. One thing I don't hear so much of now is live musicians on dance music. You hear lots of live musicians in indie still and rock, but generally dance music's gone very synthesized. Most records are made with samples and uh, synths and you don't often hear records with a live bass. You don't hear records with sax solos and whatever. It just, it's just gone out of vogue. So I, I, I'm trying to, I'm putting some of that back in and making records with, where I don't just get the bass player to play a four bar loop I get him to play from the beginning of the track to the end and it builds up in intensity and you know it goes from third gear to fifth gear I, I want that um, that thing that I used to get excited about in records I listened to in my bedroom in 1981 I want to put that into some re modern records and they still sound very different from the records that were made back then because I'm making them on modern equipment I'm not trying to make them sound like I'm not one of those people let's put it through this and this make it sound exactly the same as something from 1980 that would be pointless I'm trying to make them sound modern sound good up against the modern record but with the ingredients and the uh, musicality and I guess writing songs, I, 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 we're trying to write good songs, memorable songs, good hooks, good lyrics, not just write about having fun on the dance floor and having, uh, you know, l l you can write about love in a way that doesn't always have to be in a cheesy way. So um, I put a lot of effort into that. It's taken me about three years. Uh, not totally three years constantly, but three years, you know, I might work on it for a month, do something else for a couple of weeks, work on it for a couple of weeks, you know, so it's on and off, which I suppose is one of the beauties of modern equipment. You can keep coming back and tinkering with things. You can pretty much finish it, but then you can go back in and make some big changes. Whereas back in the old days, once you'd mixed it, there had to be something pretty wrong with it for you to go back and change it, because it was expensive, and just getting it back up exactly as you had it wasn't easy, whereas now I can go back and just turn the bass drum down one dB and everything else is going to be exactly the same. It's so much easier to tweak, but with that becomes the temptation to keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So you've got to sort of like say at some point, 
it's finished. It might not be absolutely perfect, 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 or it's as good as you're going to get it without going crazy anyway. So, but now I've finished that, I'm going to do some more electronic, more contemporary sounding stuff. Not I don't think that's contemporary, but it's not what is generally happening now in Clubland. I know that. I'm not like out of touch thinking, oh, this, you know, this is what should be happening. I know I, I make it for myself to a degree, and I know that other people will like it, but I know it's never going to go near, you know, mainstream dance floors. So I've hooked up with a couple of younger guys who are making more electronic stuff, and I'm getting together with them just to break my own rules a bit. I tend to use Logic Audio on the Mac. Some of these newer guys are using different programs for me, like Fruity Loops, Ableton, and um, I'm gonna do some more, just more electronic, more, you know, now sounding. Because I've just done a whole album with live guitar, brass section, strings. So I hope I can inject some of that into the electronic stuff to make it a little bit different from the, but also using I guess I'm very versed with working with singers and that's what maybe some of the younger guys aren't so versed with. They're doing everything inside the box and maybe using samples. So uh, I want to bring, you know, some of the experience I've had with like writing songs. So like, look, that's great, but let's not just stick a sample on it. Let's actually get someone in and write something for this. Make it more original, make it, uh, you know, something that's uh, a proper new piece of music rather than something that's sort of you know, is it a good track but steals the vocal from something else, you know. So um, that is what I'm going to be doing for the next uh, nine months. And I'm not a big planner of the future. I think the industry changes so much. You just have to go with it and make decisions at the time. What is the right thing to do now? Things have changed quite a lot in the last year and a half. We need to, you know, alter our business model. So I've always just tried to think on my feet rather than um, say this is where I'm going to be in five years time, this is where I want to be in ten years time because I don't think you can make those plans in this business. All we got to do